Good morning and welcome to your Daily Game Face. I'm Dr. Kim Lannon and I'm here with Lou Blasey who has no words today because we're going to have a conversation about why you're malleable and <laughs> that you think that, what was the? Malleable is a good word. Well, that's a good, yes, yeah. you are malleable. Yeah. And you but accused me of being a ball buster, which I said I I'm did, not that I said, person. Cause you, why did I say you were a ball buster? Because you accused me of doing something <laughs> that I had, around on me. I had no part in doing. I didn't accuse you of anything. I made a comment that I found it humorous that when I'm sitting in the car waiting to come into the studio, yep. I get alerted that I'm, my show is about to start. And I feel like sometimes that's your cue of saying you're late. And you said, why am I getting blamed for what Facebook puts out? And I said, that doctor is an accusation. Yes, uh, and I don't you know about your threat generated it as an accusation. <laughs> that I do, and yeah. then turn it around on me. Yeah, <laughs> that I do. So, um, yes. So you are very malleable, and you are a ball buster, <laughs> and that's why. So the answer to your question was why you said you know why? No, I'm why Italian. Did... This is the way it happens, right? I mean, it's because you're means, Italian. This so means you... I love you. If I'm busting oh. your balls, it means I love you. Aw, yeah. that's so nice. Yeah. Well, it's the way Italians are. It's the way, it's the way we are. <sighs> yes, I know many Italians, and they all do the same thing. So I yeah. guess we'll just lump everybody together and just stereotype it all. I'm Italian, and I'm a guy. Oh, and, and then, well, then that's we can just guy stereotype thing. guys all yeah. together, too. And I'm a team sport guy, and that's the way team sports are, right? I you guess. just sit there and... So it's just, yeah, we'll just bust right down other. the straight shoot on stereotypes all the way. That's awesome. So good morning. Well, that reminds oh. me of the saying. You've heard the old saying, if they're really out to get you, are you still paranoid? Yeah, exactly. If it's true, is it still a stereotype? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it is true. Yeah. So there mu that must be true, and it's a stereotype. Oh, we're <laughs> not going to go down this road. Okay, get me in trouble. Ooh. I, okay, so so yeah. now, see, look. <laughs> it looks People fine. People that can't, can't see me, I'm playing with that piece of hair um just that one little thing there that little thing that's going on it's okay. it's, anyway it's okay focus focus yeah. focus okay how was your valentine's day did you do everything that you were supposed to do I, that was successful yeah I, I think it was successful so that's because we talked about it i set you up good for it yeah yeah no i i can't deny that played a role oh i understood my task a little bit better so so that you performed well i think so Good job. Mm -hmm. And she was happy. I think so. Excellent. Excellent. I'm mm -hmm. so glad. So I hope everyone had a nice Valentine's Day. I had actually a lot of feedback from that show about... Did you? Yeah, it was really good about how people... Um, some people related because of the loneliness factor, but more people were relating to the fact that um, just being able to do self-care and take care of themselves and, and kind of stay in their own lane and do their thing and not, you know, superimpose all these ideas. So lots of good feedback on that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I hope that people can take that forward and keep doing that so they don't project out and mind read and on the rank of stressful holidays what is on the rank on the ranking oh. of stressful holidays yes this would be somewhat some I'm, I'm thinking this is more stressful than new year's eve it's well, not I, christmas it's not thanksgiving well what i mean thanksgiving what stress is that besides family cooking? Family. And not Easter. Just dealing not with family. Of July. No, no. It's because it's oh, interpersonal. Oh, no, 4th of July is my so favorite he, holiday. So, okay. So here's the, here's the mm -hmm. reason why I would say clinically it's the most stressful or would be considered one of those for people is because it's it's direct one-to-one -one interpersonal connecting or not connecting. Right. It's, mean, it's meaning making over your relationship. It's a self-worth, conditional, unconditional, what do you mean? Like Christmas, I mean, yeah, you could say, oh, they didn't give me a gift or that gift wasn't thoughtful or, you know, it might make some of that meaning, but when it's directly related to a love yeah. relationship yeah. or an intimacy relationship, it's not like Easter baskets and, and leprechauns and bunnies and right flags and christmas trees yeah, so i think that it's specific so to the most important relationships in your life right so it's yeah. and so it's it speaks to a make or break situation i think for a lot of people that here we it's a test mm. yep <laughs> i i had a couple conversations about that last week about you know people test each other on yes. valentine's day and how in incredibly uh failure setup it can be <laughs> for people as you know i we, agree we yeah. discussed that after I the agree. show last week yeah how it completely can go down the rat hole um, mm. for people. But I think that's why. Yep. So, I mean, just common sense would make me think that. But also, clinically, you just know that it's an interpersonal connected day, and it's been hyped up so much that people 
feel that they, you know, there's social norming, people compete against each other. We talked about that and, yep. and the flowers getting delivered and who got them in the office, who didn't, you know, who's are more, who's are yeah. better, who's are, you know, all the social comparisons. Yep. So nonetheless. But I'm good to go. I'm good to go yeah. for a while. There you go. And the See? birthday's at the end of November. And oh, so, so, you, like I, so you, you got some six months of free sailing. Like, all right. Everything's good, good for a while, yeah. So, well, funny thing. So, remember how I said about the flowers? Yep. Now, I don't know if John actually listened to the podcast last week, and nor did I ask. But on Valentine's, I got 48 white. White's my favorite rose color. So, if I'm going to do a rose, it's white. So, 48. Wait a second. Doesn't white have a message? Um, don't rose colors? That I'm an angel? <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly, yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, purity. Uh, I, no, slate, aren't there, aren't there, nothingness. I don't know. It's beautiful. Are there meanings though. to the colors of roses? Yellow is forgiveness. Well, no, or... yellow. Well, yellow is friendship. Friendship. Oh. And purple is. Uh, I love purple too, but prince? I think, I can't remember what it is. But yeah. I know red is love, and that's purple is your prince from. fan. Yeah. <laughs> so well, anyway, so I got. You know how I get around that? Why? How? I didn't buy. I didn't buy the flowers like the cut flowers and things like that. I bought a small rose uh, bush, in a oh. in a pot. Very nice. Yeah, live one. It's beautiful too. I'm sure. Yeah, have no doubt. Yeah. So anyway, so I so about me. Yes. Jeez, focus. <laughs> Theme of the day, focus. So yeah, no. So I ended up getting all these roses. Yep. But they were white, and they were this beautiful, like peachy orange color, mixed together. And then I got two huge regular bouquets of all the other flowers. <laughs> wow. And I don't think he listened to the podcast, no. so that was fine. Yeah, well. So it was very funny, um, given that I had said so much about that. And I didn't get chocolate, which is fantastic. And I didn't get, you know, bad food, yep. you know, that I don't eat. So that was good. I got chocolate. So moving along. And I got bourbon. So. We are now past President's Day. <laughs> yes. And we don't need to celebrate that anymore. Nope. Um, but so I, I've i been thinking a lot about, you know, the fact that people are into February now and you know, people are, it's not just about weight loss and all the things that people make for resolutions just around that. It's about change and how people want to make change. Most people come to see me or any, any person to go to life coaches or health coaches or whatever, they're going to make changes. That's what they're trying to do. And how, you know, I was thinking this week is what is the biggest thing that happens for people when they can't make the change? And I, I'm using the air quotes on can't is, Mm -hmm. you know, for a variety of reasons, but it's in what I think is a great topic for today and you can tell me if you think so, um, is that long-term change happens when you have long-term lifestyle changes versus the short-term change, which is the instant gratification, quick fix kind of change. So they fall. So whether it's a weight loss change or a job change or a family change or relationship change, they, there's two camps that always come down to it. It's either, you know, one that will always, always work and one that will always fail. And the short-term so think diet. Yeah. Short. If you're on a diet, put any one of them up on the you know board, and someone's done 25 different diets. The reason why is because they're short term, they're instant gratification. Somebody wants to drop weight really fast, but they're not making a lifestyle change. They're not enjoying the process. They're not invested necessarily in the process. Right. They just want to see the result. They want what they want versus putting the idea out in the world that I have a goal of what I want to be like as opposed to what I want right now. So the you know the short term one. Mm, always fails. Yep. It really does. And that's why people are yo-yo dieters or yo-yo right. um, change makers or they're indecisive. Um, there's so many things that could go for that because it all falls into the instant gratification and not delaying or not having been taught to delay. You know, we have a, a generation yeah. right now that's extremely instant gratified and, and indulged. Yep. Um, and one would say that we could say that across lots of generations that we have that and just it's based on culture context. But I think right now there's so much of that going on. I see that like in parenting and people's, you know, children's reports of themselves and how they see things and I in the way that they talk to their parents or the way the parents talk to their kids even. Um, and totally a side story on that is, you know, so I'm out to I'm out to breakfast on um valentine's day and there's a very small little place with not a lot of people in it obviously for obvious reasons but Mm -hmm. what i did see was separate families and and it kind of kills me because when i see it i'm just like oh that's so sad um they're sitting together but the kids are sitting eating and 
I see this more often than not. The kids are not on phones or anything, but the parents are on phones separately yeah. doing their thing while they're eating. So one hand has the phone, one hand has the fork. The kids are sitting with them. Nobody's talking to each other, but the kids are sitting there like looking off in space and they have no devices. Now, that's not always. Sometimes you see them all with devices and nobody's yep. talking. Um, but there's the there's the point of like, well, you have instant gratification in a way because you're instantly gratified with the technology that you're doing. You don't have to connect and interpersonally connect. And then you wonder why no one makes changes or no one gets the right um, direction to go in because they're so disconnected yep. from everything. Do you know what that represents to me? Because this has bugged me a lot lately. This is my latest thing. It's like this whole phone thing is not being present. Right. Because you're somewhere else. You're on mm -hmm. Instagram dealing with relatives or people you follow or, you know, you're just, if you're in the phone, you're not where you are. You're not present. Right. 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 You're not in the moment. Right. Well, you're in the moment of the phone. Yeah. And that, so that's to my point is you're, you're teaching the an way, instant gratification. It's, gratif an, it's an in the face, it's an in the face insult, actually. Well, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, so you and I, I yeah. will agree with you on this, that it's an in-the-face insult without it, you know, it, but there, it's the teaching of the disconnect, but there's a double standard because on the same breath, you know that the same parents are going to want the kid's attention when they want it, right. but they're not training them to be present. Right. So I want, in, you know, so instant gratification, I want you to be present only on my terms, so there's a condition. So it's very confusing, and it's very indulgent, and it's... Um, mixed messages and well, it's, it's it's modeling versus it's modeling versus talk it's like kids don't listen to what you say but they watch what you do right yeah exactly and so you know so when you have a, a 14 year old that rolls their eyes at you all the time and they're you know and they walk away from you while they're holding a phone I mean how yeah. often do you think you've done that to them and I see that happen with kids in my practice I see that you know out in the street I see you know yep. It's it's quite something. So so it, it's that you know when you're trying to make changes, going back to the original topic, is is you know instant gratification leads down these paths of modeling not great changes, behaviors, whatever. But if you're in something for the long haul, like if you're going to be a parent, right? Yeah. Well, then be a parent. Now there's no perfect parenting, but there are some kind of important things to know. Um, which is connection. Mm -hmm. And it's such a big thing when you, it's so important in terms of like addiction work, you know, people that have kids or the people that are in addiction, you can lead it right back to the fact that there's a disconnect. Now, this generation I'm watching because of the pandemic, because kids coming up through from isolation, much more, all those things are playing into that. So now we're going to have all this, I need instant gratification because I've been inside all the time. I get what I want. I don't have to do anything for it. I haven't had to leave. I haven't had to do anything. Yeah. I'm going to school online. It's very depressing, et cetera, et cetera. But now it's setting up for all the other things that are coming about, they haven't had to enjoy a process. There hasn't been any because it's been on hold, so there's delay of gratification, but not in the way that would teach someone how to really make a good change in choice because they haven't been able to do a process that's been fostered to change yeah. them. You know what I mean? Yep, I right? do. Yeah. Um, so, so taking like any topic that was, you could talk about in terms of change, it's really investing in um, how to move forward with long-term outlook. What I want, not what I want to be right now. Right. Yeah, and it's it's a matter of the process is important because, as you said, when you get into dieting, the big failure with dieting is that people can't sustain the diet. Right. Because they feel denied, they feel uh, you know they feel it's austerity, they feel like they're not getting what they want all the time. So you can't keep up with that. But there is a way to lose weight by changing your lifestyle and your your approach to things, and it's. Just, that's that makes the whole difference in the world. I mean, you could diet for a couple of weeks and lose ten pounds, you know, or you know, a month and lose ten pounds, but you can right. gain it right back. And the reason why people gain it right back, and this is the question that I get asked, is why do I keep gaining it back? Because you're not investing in the process. You're investing in the quick fix, so you can sustain, you know, a month of you know, like sober February or no sugar Tuesday, or yeah. you know, you can do those short term, but then it's you're not. You're not um, learning no. through the process of how to maintain that over time, which gives you more success. What you're learning is I hate this process. <laughs> well, you're right, because you're doing restriction <laughs> yeah. versus yeah. Um, 
there should be no restriction. So if we're talking about weight loss specifically, right, which we keep coming back to because it's such a big topic. Um, well, I think it's, I think that's a big topic, and I think it's an important topic because if you do the weight loss battle, it gives you the skills to do everything else. Right. It's it's a really great starter project. Right. And from even, a mental and, health standpoint. And and so so and in that same vein, right, Lou, the if you don't have weight to lose necessarily, because some people are like, well, this doesn't apply. If this actually applies to you, to anybody, even if you're your perfect weight or you feel okay and you don't feel like you have to lose, this is just about making good lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not a person who's necessarily overweight, you might be doing other things. You know, I have, I have a friend that's not overweight at all and he can eat <laughs> everything in the world and he doesn't exercise and he smokes <laughs> and he does other things. Yeah. So, um, you know, so there's always like these other little things that go with that change process. But, you know, when you're talking about weight loss, I think correctly, um, you know, a person really has to be invested in, it took them a long time and people don't realize to get to the weight that they're at. Right. So if it takes you that long, you walk into the woods, you got to walk back out of the woods and it's not like you have a clear path usually. Yep. So you have to clear the path so it becomes an easier route. When you're taking those short, short, quick diet routes, you sort of like, I think it was like you get a trampoline that springs you out of the woods temporarily, but the problem is you're right back in because you came out with a blindfold on and didn't realize how you got there. And yeah. now you're like, I don't know how I had to stay there and I couldn't eat that and I couldn't eat that and I couldn't eat that. And it's really about... You can actually eat anything you want. It's about, you know, how much do you eat it? How often do you eat it? And going back to those times when I've said about, you know, when yep. people make choices of, well, it's, it's just, you know, one time today. And I always say, well, any day that ends in Y. <laughs> <laughs> any day that ends in Y is always yeah. a reason too. So, you know, or it's, you know, it's just a piece of cake or it's one cookie. Well, you have one cookie every single day. That's not... Yeah. Well, that's not the thing. So um, I love how you use the word choices because uh, all the work I've done in these areas has been uh, based on memes and golf tips. And yeah. one of the ones that was in there was when the fear of staying the same is worse than the fear of change. That's when the magic happens. Right. And this is all about making choices. It's all about do I want to lose the weight or do I want this cookie? Right. Right. And people never put it in that terms. And once you put it in that term – all of this becomes easier, right? Well, yeah. Uh, yes. And well, yes. And the thing about, you know, do people, when someone says, do I, you know, do you really want to lose weight? Everybody will say yes. It's like yeah. saying to someone, do you want to be a heroin addict? No one's going to say yes, right? Everyone wants to be sober. Everyone wants to be thin or thinner or healthier yep. or whatever. It's a matter of, does a person want to put the work in? Yeah. And... You know, so, you know, that comes down to the temperament and the, and the way that the person's motivated, internal, external locus yeah. of control. Are they, you know, mitigated by external factors, social life, other people influencing them versus themselves and how they prioritize or were they taught that their, their self is more important to take care of before they take care of others before anything else, yeah. you know, and, and you get a lot of, um, I get a lot of feedback, especially from women, not being sexist, but especially from women talking about how they feel guilty to do for themselves because they've been taught, you know, that, you know, you're supposed to be humble. Therefore, you're supposed to do for others and not for, for yourself because then it looks bad. Right. Well, you can't do for others if you don't do for yourself. And there's, and it sounds cliche as always, but it's not. It's, you cannot, you can't teach or foster your kids to do something that you're not doing yourself. Right. It just doesn't happen. And, I mean, obviously people do get out of their parents' way sometimes, but by and large you're picking up the habits that are being laid down for you. And if you are if you have parents or you have models that are not going through the process and they're just going through the motions and are happy and satisfied with the adequate averageness of life, well, that's what you're yeah. going to see. And that's what you, we see a lot of, and that's why we have such an obese culture. That's why we have a non-process um, enjoyment of, you know, I mean, we're certainly trending towards more process, more mindfulness, more health-related things, clean, cleaner eating for a lot of people, um, but we still have that trend. And I'm not sure if that whole, that whole kind of old-school trend that's always, or I wouldn't say it's a trend, the, the base core will really change a lot because you have right. so much cultural normed in 
material to each of these these well, families and these communities and the ecology of their communities of you know e you know take italian right right you, you have very specific familial cultural things that drive people's choices around food yeah um and you know if we're talking about food and diet you know I grew up with Mama Valenti, and she, and just as the name implies, everything yeah. that came with that name was pasta and rich food and Sicilian heavy. I mean, we just, you know, every time I was around her, I gained 20 pounds. Yep. <laughs> right? Because, but her, and she was, you know, a heavy set, wonderful, happy person. And I think that, um, later in her life, she definitely tried to do a process that was different because she suffered. Uh, health problems because of it. Sure. Um, now, I was too young at the time to like really have any in-depth conversations, but I know people who um, are similar and really have a hard time when their process has been the Mama Valenti uh, style versus yep. the health the health run style, and you know the the I want it, but I don't know how to get it. And if you give me the tools, then it's really hard. Um, this goes back to a conversation I was having a client yesterday with about, um, he doesn't want to be on medication anymore. And we've deemed that he really doesn't need to be on medication. medication. And the only reason for... why he was on medication in the first place was because he was really looking for a quick fix so he could continue doing his job. He could do all these other things, but he had really bad anxiety and, oh. and, <clears throat> and he didn't have the skills and the tools because he didn't go to therapy. He went to see someone first for medication. He was on that for a year didn't feel a whole heck of a lot better then started seeing me got some tools and then said I don't really think I should be on all this medication so and now he wants to get off and so he informed me that <laughs> he informed me that he tried to cold turkey himself off of his current medication yeah and it was painful and I and last week to this week same me and I said you can't do that <laughs> You know, here's the instant gratification. I wanted it to help me right. in the moment, and now I want to be off of it because I don't want that. And, and, and so when I told him it was going to take about a month to wean off the particular medication, you could see the wheels turning of, well, you know, I was like, well, should I, I'll just stay on it. I don't want to make the effort to get off well, of it. See, that's the matter of degrees. If you, if you tell a person it's going to take a month to accomplish this, and they balk at it at that point, that's a lack of commitment. You know, whereas I, when you said that, I'm sitting, if I could get something I wanted in a month, yeah, I'm all in. Let's do it. Month doesn't seem like a long period of time. Right. But I think yeah. it's when people haven't had, you know, mindfulness. Like when I think, you know, you know, like when kids, you say that, you know, you're, you're 35 years old, they look at you like you're dead. You know, it's, it's the, where's your mind at? Where's your cognizance at? So when you say a month to some people, that yeah. seems like <clears throat> forever. Meanwhile, you know, you and I are like, oh, February is almost over. <laughs> it's like, there it goes. <laughs> yep. um, you know, so. Um, but I, this is, I, so this committing is... to something that takes a long time, if you're looking at it long term and thinking, oh, a year from now, you can't do it that way. You have to be yeah. like, what I do today, it's just a day at a time. Go ahead. But you said long term. A month isn't long term. But in people's minds, it is psychologically for many people because of the instant gratification culture. Yeah. It, the, the, a month is like forever when it's really nothing. Yeah. And it's like, again, it's how you want... He wanted to be off the medication, and a month a month worth of work. By the way, what work? We're, we're weaning down the amount as as you get off the medication. Yeah, it wasn't exactly hard labor. Right. He balanced the two and was questioning the worth of being off the medication. That's, right. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. It, well, and, and I think that that's you know, in in my field, I see that a lot when people are wanting. You know, I help people often get off of medication, and mm -hmm. that's the biggest balker is. What do you mean it's going to take that long? Yeah. Um, because it's they just want it now, and I'm like, well, you could do it, but here are the here are the ramifications of doing that. Kind of like when you're talking about a diet. Well, you could do this and then eat the cake every day, but here's what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then people have to make those choices of which direction they're going to go in, and and people just want to make it easier. You know, I can't I can't tell you how many round and round conversations I've had over the same topic with someone about how always looking that maybe there's an easier way. And I quote, yeah. maybe isn't there an easier way? Isn't there an easier way? No, this is how it has to happen. And, and I can guarantee if you do these steps, it will work, but I can guarantee that if you don't do them, you know, it won't work as simple as that. And, and people often go off and try do and come back and say, well, it's not working. And my answer always is because <laughs> you're not doing it the way I told you to do it. 
Right. And it's not because I'm saying I'm right. I'm, there's a very specific way of doing certain things um, that work. And therefore, it's more about, like, if you don't do the process correctly, it's not going to work. And you will have these deficits or feeling like you're not getting it done because, you know, if you if I say go and don't eat white bread for the next six weeks and you have it a couple times a week, yeah. you know, yeah. we, don't, we don't know what it's like to have you not have white bread or, you know, anything that has processed anything in it or something like that. So it's really about are you, like you said, commitment. Um, and and the pain of staying the same versus the pain of the change, yep. which is, you know, and the biggest motivator for people to really, truly change is people have to hit their bottom. And, you know, whether it's drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, eating, relationships, whatever it is, is if you don't have enough pain in the moment of what you're doing, even if it's painful. Yeah. It has to be painful enough to you subjectively to have it change. So, you know, you either have to be, you know, at your, you know, if 10 pounds is your weight limit over and that's enough for you that you feel like that's enough for one person, that's great. Another person who's 600, you know, 600 pound life, yeah. <laughs> it's not enough pain yet to get to the change. And, and, you know, people are like, oh, it's because they're lazy or they're unmotivated or no, it's just people haven't gotten to their, their, their bottom yet, whatever that is. Right. And some people don't, some people end up, you know, dying and that's the bottom. Right. You yes, know? Yeah. And, I, I mean, facetiously, but not really, because it's it's just that they, they didn't do the process. They did a process, but it wasn't the one in the right direction. It's it's down to me for the, to me, it comes down to the basic building block of parenting, it, uh -huh. which is connecting action and consequence. Right. And we are several generations into that disconnect, and we talk about delayed gratification, and it's about action and consequence, because instant gratification is about, I don't have to do any of the work to get this. Right. I just take a pill or you know, whatever it is, however you get your instant gratification. And that's never satisfying because there's no work behind it. There's no, you know. Right. So when something that comes up that needs a commitment, that needs work behind it, it's difficult to do. And and you see that, well, I see that a lot. You know, I mean, people come in all the time because they're trying to make changes. So I see a lot of that in general, both in adults and kids, you know, that they've either oh. been modeled and now they're adults and having that issue or the parents are bringing their kids and saying, here you go. And I'm going back to the parents saying what you're saying is like, you need to do a better modeling job here of showing, be better, you know, be yeah. better at being a parent by showing that you require more, you ask for more instead of just being, you know, shoot for mediocre down, the, down the middle, yep. which is a big, big, big pattern. I see, yeah. especially or, in, the, in the past 10 years, I just see average, average, average. And, and it's not so much parents. Uh, it, this is a big problem. Parents aren't doing the action to consequence connection. They're shielding kids from consequences. Right. Well, justifying it's okay. Or, listen. Um, Minimizing. Uh, the teacher says, if I don't get any better, I'm going to have to go to summer school. And the parent goes in and talks to the teacher and talks them out of summer school. Mm -hmm. Like, let the kids go through summer schools. you got to pick some bridges that the kid's going to hit. Right. To establish that action and consequence selection. But if you're protecting them from it all the time, they think there's always a protection from it. Okay. Right. You know, I'm overweight. I'll just start taking a pill. You know, and that's that's going to change things. Well, right, and yeah. and and I think we're, for lack of better words, I think it's that we're that we have this excuse culture right mm -hmm. now is making the excuses for why we aren't or why we didn't or yeah. why we can't or why we won't. And unless it's instantly gratified and given or easy or everybody gets the trophy, then we just don't do it. We colloquially, yeah. but I and I think that what a um, damaging thing to collective society or collective communities or families that you not modeling that because that's where you get into why change is so hard for people. You know, yeah. change is hard for everybody. But when you have really good modeling that change is hard, but here's what you do to get it. And it's so rewarding and satisfying. So you have accomplishment and sense of purpose and you have good mindfulness and movement forward versus you know, disappointment, you have, you set the bar up really high, you, you fail because there's no, there's no scaling in between yeah. to get the scaffolding up to get the person, whether it's an adult or whatever, to that point, because they just don't have the reward system, the praise, the um, re-teaching or the reconnection of how to do it better this next time when you, when you didn't do it as well this time, so that you're, you're still moving forward, getting lots of praise for it, 
even though you might have failed, you're still moving it forward. Yep. And that's missing a lot. And so you don't have the, the process. It goes back to people don't do the process because they don't know the process, they haven't seen the process, or the process is just overwhelming to them. Yeah, and I think a large part of it is what you talked about, about externalizing control, thinking you're a victim of all this stuff. I remember when I was, when I weighed about 40 pounds more than I do now, Right. And had back issues, all kinds of issues, and I didn't do anything about it. And I used to joke about it. I said, "Well, you know, I'm this age. I've earned it. Right. You know, it's an age thing. I'm getting old. I'm going to have a little extra weight, and I'm going to have some back issues." And then I really hurt myself with the back, and finally went to get some treatment, and that involved a routine and strengthening as well as the treatment. And I felt great. I go, "Well, okay, it's not the age. It's that I didn't do it. I didn't do the work. I didn't take care of it." You know, and then that led to the weight loss because that was the next thing. Well, if I if my back can feel this good at this age, given my history, I, I can lose the weight too. And so right. I set the goal and went and did it. And you, and there's a particular thing about your mindset, which I'm sure a lot of listeners can relate to. That is is I would imagine you had modeled for you from coaches or other that you knew how to look for those things that you knew that you didn't just become complacent and complicit to your I'm older, therefore this is my lot in life, and therefore I actually can do something about it. Whereas I think a lot of people do not do that process at all. Well, like, I needed the help. I needed the help. It was a chiropractor at the time. Right. I needed the help and got the alignment, and she put me on a path, and I saw results. Right. And I'm like, holy cow, it's not and an I, age and thing. And that's it's, the motivator yeah. is once yeah. you start seeing it. So so when, I, when, I have, when I'm helping someone with weight loss, for instance, I'm having to make changes – as soon as I, you know, like after the first week, if they lose, you know, if they're heavier, they've lost five pounds, I often have like a five pound weight in the office or I have a five pound bag of something or, you know, on purpose and I'll put it in their hand and I'll say, yeah. this is what you just lost so that it's a visual, like, oh my gosh, because you don't, unless you can tangibly see it, yep. you know, you might not realize it, but when you've got five pounds or 10 pounds and you go here, hold this, this is what you just lost. Do you want that back? It's such a great reinforcer for the consequence of imagine now that's why it's pulling on your back and hold it in front of you and, and see how long you can do that before everything in your body gets sore. And you wonder why your knees are sore, your back is sore, your shoulders are sore, your, right. you know, whatever, because it's it, it, because people need to see that. I, I think that reinforcers or or like you were saying, to motivate people more, they need to see that. So the chiropractor adjusting you and getting on the right track is helpful it's when you have people that don't go to the chiropractor. It's yeah. how do you get them to this spot where they can make that first step or change? That's why I'm always the baby stepper of, you know, get up and every every hour and a half set an alarm to get up and walk around your house, you know, in circles ten times, or go yeah. to the mailbox and back, um, walk up and down stairs, you know, uh, do five jumping jacks, do ten set ups, whatever it is, so that you're having something to start you. Just especially now that so many people are still home and they're isolating. Like I said, I think last week or the week before, I have yep. I have clients that have not left the house literally in a year. Yeah. They've not left the house. Not left the house. They have not left the house. Wow. They have everything delivered. They go outside in their backyards, but they haven't left. Yeah. And that, first of all, that's unhealthy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but it's it's that um, there's no action. There's no motivation. They tended to be like that a little bit anyways. This kind of gave them more of an excuse. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic actually reinforced yep. a lot of bad behaviors that people were already doing, or unhealthy behaviors. I won't say bad behaviors, but unhealthy behaviors people were already doing. Yeah, we're all going to die anyway, so why can't I have a cookie? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. seriously. I yeah. mean, joking aside, I can't tell you how many blatant straight-on people cases of being able to hear that from people and then just implied from people that you know well you know what's the big deal you know what's another month blah 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 yep. you know because people become so beaten yep. down by it but my counter to that is you're not doing the process you have no reason to not still be doing a good process that's right. not an excuse you found it as an excuse you're using it as an excuse you know and then complaining about how you're stuck, you're isolated. Oh, this pandemic, it's killing me. But no, you're making choices to do that. But we'll take, we'll continue with the weight loss example. And okay. people who don't need to lose a few pounds, a fitness example, right? Getting a little bit more fit. There's two byproducts to that that are very underrated. One of which is exercise helps your mood. Yes. And that's a huge. And you've talked about it from time, from time to time, having an intent, having a purpose. 
Right. And if you're on a program and you're working to lose some weight and you do the exercise, you get the boost from the exercise, you get the endorphin boost from the exercise, and you get to get up in the morning and it's like, I've got something to do. I'm, a, I'm on a program. I'm, right. A, I have an intention here and I'm going to continue to do it. And it might be a, an hour out of your day like every other, every other day. Right. But it's a program and it's something an intent, you have intentions on and it's for you and that there are benefits to that. Right. Sticking to that program. And, and so making, so so that's to a good point, you know, when you're talking about a process. And you it's think, like I can't understand how you people run. And you people run will tell me I love running. Because when you, you get running, you, you love it. I do. Right? Yes. And it becomes, it doesn't, get, it doesn't get that way with me for the gym, but I miss it when I don't go. And it's not like I hate going. I, don't, I can't say I love it, but I don't hate it. It's it's a good hour of just well it's well it's your and you use it as a means to an end right yeah, yeah. so I mean it's just dependent on and that goes to like purpose and and intent and all those things is it's a means to an end whatever your means to the end is and what that fits for you so my running sometimes is stress relief yeah. sometimes it's just for enjoyment sometimes it's you know for a little extra weight loss or feeling like a little less blah. Um, so mine always changes when it comes to that kind of stuff. Whereas a lot of people are just like, I'm going to the gym because I'm supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> I have to go to the gym. And, and so, you know, that's a very different mindset than the yeah. one that I'm using for what I do. But, but that doesn't last long. Which one? Mine or yours? No, the mindset, the mindset of, oh, I got, I'm going to the gym because I have to. That doesn't last long. Right, because why? It's instant gratification, it's short term, and there's not a commitment behind it that's a long term in the process. You're going to the gym because it's part of the process of make, you know, eating breakfast every day, making sure you drink a lot of water, making sure you're having good sleep, making sure you're not triggered in your environment to eat things like donuts because everything in the, in the break room has donuts in it. Like, it's a process. So yep. it's one little piece in the process if you look at it like that. But... If not, then it's just instant gratification, short term, and that's why it fails and dies. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, well, my whole plan was I was going to, on January 1st, I was going to lose 25 pounds in the month. Right? We've talked yeah. about that, right? Yeah. Um, totally uh, not doable unless you're 500 pounds. Yeah. Um, but it's it's the, I went to the gym five times this week and I only lost a pound. And it's like, oh, it didn't, instant gratification didn't work, so I'm done. Right. Well, yeah, but you also then sat the rest of the day. You ate anything and everything you wanted because you didn't portion control. You didn't eat vegetables. You ate. Yeah, and by the way, when you first start working out, you want to eat. You right. Know, it's, 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 it's part of the process. Right. Yeah. Right, because your body's metabolism is changing yeah. and you're converting different things. And people don't, real, and people don't realize how much weight loss um, and, and the process of just life, life management has to do with stress and hormones and cortisol in your body. So if we strip all of this away, and we're not even talking just about weight loss, everything in your body is constantly talking to your brain because of the elevation or de-escalation of cortisol in your body, mm -hmm. the pancreas dumping over and over again of how much. So that makes you make good decisions. It gives you good sleep or not. It gives you good eating habits or not. Um, it gives you good choices in terms of fight and flight and going towards something or away from something. So here we go again is if you're constantly feeding the body with instant gratification because your body's an alarm system all the time because your cortisol's dumping. Yeah. Well, you have I need very this. I have patterns. to have this. Yeah. You what? I need this. I have to have right, this. Right, yeah. right, right. And yeah. because it feeds that that hormonal surge in your body of of, you know, the more tired you are, the more likely you're going to have extra cake, cake pizza, you're going to go to the comfort foods to make that feel good, but what it's doing is it's reinforcing in your body. Now, we were talking reinforcement external. You're reinforcing in your body that I can feel good temporarily through soothing through these things, which make me more tired, which make my pattern of sleep poor still because yep. I'm not giving myself the opportunity to clear out the system. So if, and people don't think a lot about this, at least in my practice about in, until I start talking about it, is that your body's hormonal level of cortisol that regulates your system of sleep, eating, happiness, sadness, all those things. If that's not regulated through exercise and clean eating, your body's constantly in alarm state, going in and out, in and out, in and out, and you're just feeding it mindlessly. Yeah. Um, 
with processed food, junk, on the fly, instant gratification. You know, people say, oh, I don't want to have to. That's so much work to have to cook vegetables. It's easier to go to McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's easier to get, it's, it's easier to cook a, a, a thing of macaroni and cheese than to make vegetables. No. No. <laughs> yeah. But it's in yeah. a person's mindset that it's instant gratification, you know. And then, you know, and then they make the little packs and everything gets packaged so that it's even more convenient. But then the thing is, is you can still do that with vegetables. You can still do that with, you know, little portions of chicken. And you can, but people just don't take the time because the culture is, you know, 100 calorie packs and right. quick microwavable things and, you know, throw in the oven pizza. Pizza takes 25, 30 minutes to cook, and people complain about that it takes too long to make a salad. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's that, it's that culture of now versus even if you point out that that's still the now and you can still have that, it's not what the person is trained to. So they go towards the short-term thing, which always fails, and, and it always does, and I typically don't say always, but short-term instant gratified people are not as successful like in their goal setting to get where they really want because they get in their own way. Yep. Something. I mean, they may not be, I'm not talking failure in life. I'm just saying they fail at these goals that they want because that piece gets in the way and keeps impeding them over and over again. And they may be, you know, skyrocketed to the top of fame and fortune. That doesn't last long for people typically that have that, that, pattern right um it's people that have much more the long-term lifestyle change process enjoy it be mindful be present you know make active choices that are healthy um they're they have a longer sustained relationships marriages kid relationships family relationships good relationships with food for the most part like you just have a better outcome it's like secure attachment versus insecure attachment you know, so it, it, everything kind of goes together when you're talking all of these things for, for changes. It's And I, I think one of the big things here, one of the big benefits of therapy, and not necessarily for weight loss, but certainly it helps with weight loss, it's, it's about awareness. A weight loss weight loss is very easy because you can track how many calories you take in. You can track how many calories you burn. You can quantify it. It can be very clear. A lot of the other things when you're dealing with relationships, when you're dealing with depression, when you're dealing with other mental health issues, much less quantifiable, but right. you still need to up your awareness of your patterns and your thought process and um, the ways you get to those areas you don't want to get to. Because right, so people just go along and say, I'm depressed or I'm, you know, I'm anxious or, okay, well, why? So, you know. Well, so, so interesting that you bring that up because – so when people use the terminology, so here's like if, it, so like weight loss, if we're going to talk about like depression, anxiety, and people come in and say, I'm so depressed. I always, here's the always again, I always say, can you give me five other words to describe depressed to me? Depressed or anxious to right. me. Yep. Because when you do that, you're now you're starting to train the brain. It's like picking different food items. You always go to that over umbrella right. catch all word when is that really what you're telling me? Well, or depression is, it... is the external. That's externalizing. Right. Putting right. it on quote unquote depression it's is the handing it off. Yeah. It catches what I feel. And so when yeah. I say, give me five other words, and you get things like, I'm lonely, I'm sad, I feel down sometimes, I feel angry. Um, I feel nervous and worried about the, like now you start fleshing out, but so I, I, it's, it's like weight loss. I push people towards really what's going on versus using a catch all phrase or eating everything they want. It's the same thing. It's what is really going on. Don't just label it and then think, well, this is what it is because it's such a misnomer. Cause you hear everybody says, I'm so depressed. Yeah. I'm so depressed. Like, you know, I had, this is years ago, I had someone say, I'm so depressed. And I'm like, why? And they were so outwardly, well, they had spilled something on a very expensive rug. And and I'm like, really? Yeah. You know, in my internal head bubble, I'm like, really? And I had to explain. I'm like, now, when you say you're depressed, here's what it really means in the real world terms. Now, what does that mean? Like, you, you're you sad that you spilled it and you ruined the rug? Are you sad? You, it totally changed a person's 
yep. mindset after. And they're like, oh, I see that. I'm like, you got to stop saying that over and over to yourself because what it does is the brain has a, a meaning maker of it. And when you say that, that's where it goes. So you spilling red wine, I can't remember what it was, but red wine on the carpet isn't depressing. It's kind of maybe yeah. upsetting. It's inconvenient. It's a nuisance. You're mad because it's expensive. But are you really depressed? Because depression is not that. <laughs> well, the general concept of depression is, again, a place where they can go where it's out of my control. Right. I, I don't have to work on this because I can't. Yeah, because uh, right, Depression is too to. big. Right. If you're angry about something, if you're lonely, if you're hurt about something. you have something, something you can do about it. You have something you can work on, right? You can and people don't want to do that because that takes work, work and it's not instant gratified. Right. Right. Well, and that's why I think that I think the process of therapy for a lot of people is frustrating because it's the process versus going to a psychiatrist and getting your pill because you don't have to face any of that. And that's I'm sure that's very frustrating for lots of my clients. And I know that when I talk about this with my students, I teach about how to become counselors. I'm, I always say that it's it's one of the biggest problems that you're going to face is when you tell someone that. <laughs> The process is going to make it feel better, and just putting the medication on is just a band aid because you're still going to have to do the work underneath, which right. is what you know my client was figuring out yesterday, is that he knew that the work was already being done. He wanted to get off, but he was like, "I want it out now because it's not serving me the purpose." But then he had to do the work. Yeah, it's the same thing. Like, you know, there's way more people in the world that are on medication than there are doing therapy. Oh, and it starts so young. It's just, uh, you know. Well, it's easier. It's easy, yeah. Right? And the thing is, is it, and people are actually surprised by this when I say medication in, in psych, right, doesn't make thoughts go away, doesn't change your thinking, doesn't change your situation. The only thing it does is it calms your nervous system down, that, that polyvagal nerve that we have that runs from, you know, our, our neck down into our body and runs the length and it regulates all of our emotions and it's stimulated yep. by the emotional center in the brain. That is constantly <coughs> being stimulated or not. So it's being regulated all the time or dysregulated for many people because they're always in a state of, you yep. know, and when you give an instant gratification to something, that, that thing in the body settles but it's never getting reignited to do it on its own. It's always looking for the externals to get it r regulated up. Yep. And that goes back to that whole process of, you know, weight loss or relationships, instant gratification. Because every time you're instantly gratified, it settles, settles the system. But the system never learns how to maintain it on its own. Right. Because you're trained it into, I need to have it constantly being refilled, refilled, refilled. Yep. Kind of like codependent relationships. Yes. Right? And, you know, with the medication, I can continue to do the same things I always did, and medication right. will fix it. Well, no. Not really. Well, and people and people don't realize that medication, as you, as you get older, or even, say, take a teenager. People have their kids, you know, taking, you know, methylphenidate, Ritalin, Concert, all those things, like in their young, young years. Cringeworthy, right? Yeah. And then they get them into their teen years, and it's not working anymore. And people are like, well, what's wrong? I'm like, because... As you age, your hormonal hormonal ranges and your metabolism starts to shift, and sometimes medications need to be changed, or they're not necessary anymore because the body has changed its way of dealing with it, and so you have to change either something else or you come off of them. Yeah. And I just think I think that there's and such after a, that point, you've disarmed your body's ability to regulate. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is that's why I'm not a big fan of kids being on medications because yeah. there's the body still developing the brain still developing you know until 23 ish years old um when you put kids on high level stimulants when they're seven eight nine ten and they're 16 years old and they're really dependent on them but they don't have the skills and they're so there we have great research that says when you do medication and cognitive behavioral therapy which is the type of therapy i do when you do them together then you have a really great chance of um, great success of the client having the issues resolve themselves out because <clears throat> the goal is to get rid of the medication so the person has the coping strategies that they didn't have there in the first place. Yeah. But as you know, kind of like many systems that get created in the world, you put in the crutch that's something that's instant gratifying and immediately that's that becomes the norm and right. so you still do the therapy but the medication is like oh don't let go of it don't let go of it don't let go of it because one it's it feels good but also because now you've created a space where the person's not sure what it will be like without it 
Right. And that's and you, scary. So it's a threat generation of, oh, I've done so well with it. That means what if I'm off of it? I don't do well. And then what, you know, and I always say, well, you just go back on it if that's the case. But in the space of kids, you're working with a third party, you know, making decisions about right. whether the child should be on the medication or not. And the, the child isn't probably self-aware enough to make those decisions. And the parent's worried about, well, what if we stop, you know, it's going to go back to the behavior or the behavior is going to get worse. And it's like, well, yes, but he's got some skill. You've got to install some skills. Right. Plus, parents, even I'm guessing when you're doing therapy with kids, it requires parental backup. Right. It's, it's, you can't. I used to say when they were talking about school lunch programs and they were taking Doritos out of the vending machine at school, is it's not the four ounce bag of Doritos in school. Right. It's the family size bag that the kid's eating at home with two liters of, of Pepsi while he's playing video games. That's the problem. Oh, and don't tell your don't tell parents. That. Well, <laughs> I know. Oh, it's it's totally true. I I absolutely agree with that because yeah. it's you know kids buying the four the four ounce bag at the school they're just that's an extension of what's going on at home. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean everyone's patting themselves on the back because they're denying four ounces of Doritos to kids in school, but that's not the problem. You're right. misidentifying the problem, and when you misidentify the problem, all your actions are just bad. They just right. don't work out. Yeah, and and. Oh my gosh, there's so many. When you just gave that, I had this like slew of like cases and things that have happened over the years of like things around that particular topic that yeah. how many reinforces are really going on at home. And again, this isn't about blaming parents, but it's about holding parents accountable that you've really got to be show, paying attention to the process you're setting forth of like the convenience level and the things that you're doing. And if you're not being, if you're being blind to, the kid sitting down with the bag of Doritos with the two liter of Pepsi and playing video games, you know, why are you buying the, why are you buying the two liter bottle of Pepsi and why are you buying the Doritos? Because they shouldn't be in your house in the first place as a regular standard. <laughs> I remember the story, I, I was doing a talk show and I remember the story about this woman who was suing McDonald's because oh, yes. she couldn't keep her six year old from the Happy Meals because there were toys in them. Stop going through the drive through it, it, No, the concept that this, you had no control over the six year old. Mm -hmm. It was McDonald's problem. It's like, you know, and, and my kids and I, I'm not, I'm not bragging about this in any way. We went to McDonald's once a year for Shamrock Shakes. That was it. Yeah. Well, you know? yeah. I mean, I grew up like it was. I think when Chicken McNuggets came out back in the day. Oh yeah. I I, I got to go to have Chicken McNuggets, but it wasn't very often, and yeah. it was far and few between. And it was a but think it was about a the treat. think about the parenting relationship. Think about that home environment right. where the woman thinks she's out of control over whether her six year old goes. Is she driving herself? Is she walking? Right. No, you're bringing if her. If I had a, if I had a dollar, yeah. just a dollar for every time I've had to say to a parent, "Who's the parent?" Yeah. <laughs> and that look of like, "Well, I am," and and it, then it reg then it registers like, "How old are they?" Yeah. You know, because it's it, but it's that it's that it's the culture again of I don't want to upset my I remember remember back remember back I want to say it yeah. probably started about twenty twenty five years ago with. We're going to use our indoor voices. Yeah. And we're going to be asking everybody how they feel, which is great, and you should. But there's a point where it got yeah. out of control. Yes. And this is part of that. <laughs> it's part of the the child becomes too... Um, empowered. Empowered inappropriately for the age, and therefore, by the time they're in my door, yeah. the ship has sailed. And here's the thing, and I'll say this again, and I get in trouble for this every time, but I'm going to say it again. Uh-oh. Raising a kid is like a, having a dog. Yeah. The dog does not want, the child does not want to be the alpha. No. Your child does not want to run the show. That makes your child anxious, and they're unhappy about it. Right. And they will come back at you hard and long about structure, but they love it. Right, because they thrive in it. Yeah. Kids thrive in structure. They want you to be in control. They don't want to be in control. And too many parents let the child control the relationship and control the life of the family when and thinking that's what the child wants, but that's not what the child wants. But this goes back to the exact topic I'm talking about today, which is that's the long-term process that becomes more successful versus the short-term, which is the indulgent, permissive, instant gratifying, easier route even though the outcome yeah. is poor or more poor, right? So when you yeah. have adults, so there's four types of parenting. I'm just going to go on this little quick run because we're but talking your about child that. Is pr you, your child is problematic because it, it arrived there. And what you do is you ship them off to school for six hours a day. Right. And you, you hand off the problem. And the problem is we're generation, generationally 
two or three generations into this where you've got parents raising kids without having the parenting skills because their parents didn't have the parenting skills. Well, right. And so so you have so what I was going to say is you have the secure attachments, right? You have mm-hmm. secure types of parenting. So you have the authoritative, which is high task, high warmth. So you expect a lot and you give warmth and praise. Yep. But when there's something wrong, you still praise, but you give corrective, appropriately, age appropriately corrective right. action without punitive damage or, or consequences that are appropriate. That's like the best type. Yep. Then you've got the three other types. You've got authoritarian. I think I've talked about it, right? It's do as I say, not as I do. Right. It's very militant. It creates lots of dependency, codependency. You know, there's still usually success in some way, but it's it's a very anxious child. Then you've got the other two that we're really talking about today in terms of like all the other issues is that the indulgent and the permissive. So you're, you're either low in warmth, low in task, yeah. or you're, you're high in warmth and low in task, right? So you're indulgent or you're permissive. Yep. And, and you have the permissive type is the type that by the age of 14 for statistically, I want to say it's like 70% more likely by the age of 14 to have a juvenile delinquent record of some sort or something in the works because it's so... That's the permissive category. Yeah, yeah. it's so, it's yeah. so in you know, it's, it's so um, permissive, but it's also so instantly gratified that it's like anything goes. It's like whatever. It's, you know, the parents that are their friends with their kids. Yeah. And they want to start, like, you know, the you know, whispers in the air of like, let's now just be, you know, because it's our secret, that kind of stuff. Or, you know, go yeah. out and I won't say anything, you know. And that just creates that. But it's also creating the instant gratification. You see a lot of drug addiction and alcohol addiction come out of that. You see a lot of um, really poor relationships come out of those things when kids are getting older. Yeah. And this goes back to they're not in the long haul process. They're in the short term failure based, you right. know, diet that didn't work. You yeah. know, it's like, oh, I'll try this and I'll try that. And, you know, it's like a parent saying, oh, I've, I tried this. It didn't work. Well, they're also now 13 and you didn't do that when they were four right. and they were running the house. And here you go. The difference between authoritative and uh, what were the two? Authoritative and authoritative is your best kind. Yeah. Authoritarian. Authoritarian. Is the, the difference between the two is punishment and consequence. In other so... words, I don't believe you should. I don't believe you should ever let the child think he's being punished. You let the child think he's suffering the consequences of his actions. Right. Like. Yeah. Right. Well, choice. So I would say you made a choice. Yeah. And here's what happened. So the th- yeah. but authoritarian is so the less good kind so it's high in expectation and very low in warmth if nothing at all yeah. so it's i expect i expect i expect think military right military right, but yeah. and then when you don't get it it's full-on punishment it's like yep. you're gonna drop and give me a hundred and you're gonna have this and that happen and that's where you come in and i say to parents like when you just told your kid for taking the extra donut that they lost their phone for a whole week that punishment or that consequence doesn't meet that crime. Now you have to hold to that over a donut. Like, right. you know, it's it's the extremes of those things. It's like, well, that's... And by the you, way, if Now you, when they really do yeah. something, yep. what do you have? And by the way, if you don't hold to it, you've lost the battle. You, it, you've, right. The, and that's, the whole war is lost at that point. And time and again, I yeah. see parents dropping that um, because they're not in the process. Yep. It's, the, it's the, you know, just like weight loss, long-term, short-term. And parents will say to me, but it's just so painful. I just give in. I'm like, well, this is why you have the problem because you've lost your credibility. They know, and and kids will say to me, "I know it's not going to stay. Yep. I know that they're going to give it back to me. I know that this is going to happen, so it doesn't really matter." And so they kind of go, "Whatever." So you don't see kids getting upset or feeling the consequence. Um, I I mean, when I was growing up, I'm not being like all Pollyanna. I didn't get in trouble because I knew just by a look, and it never. I didn't know what it was going to happen. I just knew. <laughs> Yeah. There was that look of, You're, I'm going to probably kill you, and I just was afraid <laughs> of it. So I was just, I didn't know what the consequence was ever going to be. So I just didn't get in trouble because I didn't want the consequence. Yeah. And I don't see kids with that. So, and my parents were always invested in that long process of making sure that, I mean, I haven't had that conversation with them, but I'm assuming that they just want to make sure that I was yeah. staying on the straight and narrow and, and doing good things and healthy and all those things, which I ended up being. But I don't think it was, uh, there was no instant gratification in my house. No. Um, and there was, you know, high expectation. 
I wouldn't there was say no I gratification had, I wouldn't say in my I had house. authoritative parenting. <laughs> yeah. I had much more authoritarian parenting by and large. Yeah. But I had a balancer, my grandmother. So oh, God. Yeah. She, was my, she was my yummy in between that gave me <laughs> the, the authoritative stuff. So it was a good balance. And you have that a lot in families. You know, you have the, the moderators who keep the process going that's for the long haul. Yep. But culturally right now, at least what I see and in my colleagues and I talk about is, is much more the indulgent and permissive. And this is why we have lots of, you know, average, let's shoot for average, you know, let's, let's just be on the cusp of unmotivated and can't you do it for me and I'll do it later. And can't you just wait five minutes and no, no, I asked you to do it now. And uh, you you get a a series of kids who go into something for a week or two and then they drop it. It's just like, there's, they live on the height of the newness and novelty of it for a while. Right. And then when that wears off, it's like, oh, I'm done. Right. Yeah. And just don't have the perseverance to continue. But the, ba- the basic example, and I heard it the other day. I was laughing because I heard it the other day. A mother with a couple kids in a grocery store, and, mm-hmm. you know, the kids are acting up. And the mother's like, you know, if you keep this up, we're just going to go home. I mean, do you want to go to Panera? I want to go to Panera, too, but I'm not going to be able to. And it's like this whole conversation. It's yep. like, no. Pick them up, drive them home. Right. Right. And then but it's why didn't we go to Panera? It's because she put it out there and she yeah. doesn't want to inconvenience herself. She's trying to use right. it as a tactic. And I hear it must be grocery stores because I hear this stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> grocery stores. It's like. Well, think about this. grocery stores for a kid, it's, you know, a right. six year old. Right. I, mean, I, and, you know, I, and it's a I, wonderland. I, I applaud sometimes when I've seen parents pick their kids up and take them out and put them in the car and say, we're, I've seen the process. And I've also seen people get mad at them for like, oh, what are you doing to your child? I'm like, they're doing what they should. I watched the whole thing. Yep. This is, like, appropriate. The child's going. By the way, you do that twice. And it never and happens again. And you're done. Right. Right? Exactly. As opposed to repeating the same, if you don't behave, we're going to have to leave threat. And, and, I, and I, well, there's so many things. There's, this is a whole nother show. But, but it's, the thing it's of this the, is, you put them in the car, and then they get upset, and they ask why. You have the conversation. It's like, you're out of control. Right. It wasn't, um, it's not I'm punishing you. Right. Because... Kids react to punishment differently than they react to, oh, I did this and this is what happened. Right. That's the connection you want to make. Right. Exactly. They did this and this is what happened. You're not being punished. Just you're out of control. Can't right. do it. It's just, yeah, it's just I can't have you doing that. Yeah. I have parents that have been in these scenarios and their biggest concern isn't that they're being good parents. Is that DCF is going to get called. Oh. That, so that's what I was going to say is that they get what, worried so that putting the, them in the, the car? Child Protective Service yeah. is going to get called because they have you know manhandled and picked their child up when they've been laying in the middle of the grocery store floor um, and put in the car while somebody is saying, how could you do that to your child? It's like, because they were about to rip the entire wall of like canned soup down. That's yeah. why. Yep. <laughs> and you know so you have you have well, that's why i was saying there's another show in this because yeah you know people get you talk about externally driven to change your process that you would normally do because people are so worried about oh my god i i touch my child i pick them up i move them manhandling them into the car or whatever yeah. or, so people are very tolerant in a store or whatever of of letting really? them do that. Yeah. I've seen people let their kids run amok and you just know they're struggling. And then some kids are running amok because their parents don't care. I mean, but for, for fear of DCF, I mean. Right. Yeah, no. Right. No. So anyway. Parent your child. <laughs> what? Parent your child. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not telling you to haul off and whack the kid no, across no, no, the no, grocery aisle. This is just like, yeah. get, you take the empowerment. But by the, see, my thing is, is by the time a kid is in the store doing that, we already have so many other problems that that's what's happening in the store that child probably shouldn't have been in the store in the first place but that's the essence of the show isn't it because we've talked about it before you're dealing with uh six-year-old problems at three you're dealing with 16 year old problems at nine Nine. you know and and so it's a long game parenting is a long game right all of your mental health all of the things that you're dealing with is a long game right and and to the point of the show is that the the short game the short-term stuff that's the quick fixer stuff does not work right when you put an implementation of a pattern of long-term gain over time that's consistent in patterning as best you can you're going to have better outcomes across the board whether it's weight loss parenting relationships you know whatever it is it's it's just that way so by the way it's not linear either no i mean all the stuff all the stuff i went through all the mindfulness that i went through there were years when i was beating on it and working on it and conscious of it and got nowhere, and I can't even tell you when the switch flipped, but at a certain right. point, it did. Right. And I, I sometimes even wonder myself, at what point did I get here? Because I don't remember doing I remember trying to get here, 
but I don't remember that moment when it when hap- it happened, right? Because no. it's because you're part. It's a journey. It's a long. Yeah. It's like self actualization all the time is happening because you're constantly on the journey. It's a lifelong journey, and and many people live in the lifelong journey, and many more people live in the short chunks, hoping for the next best thing because that's what makes them feel good. It fills their cup up and it makes them feel good, and then. Now I got to go searching for it again. Versus, oh, that was great. It's along my path. Oh, yeah. that was great. It's along my path, and I'm going to keep going. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. All right. So I have a couple of uh, finishing touches on this. So, so let's try to have a week of maybe delaying some gratification and trying some patterns of longer term health goals, maybe for people out there. Play um, the long game more. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then next week, we will have Calvin Evans joining us from Colorado. He'll be waking up early to join us next week. (laughs) He is um, a member of our Human Baton in training for the Human Baton that I'm part of. Um, It's our race experience, race uh, 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 franchise experience, and he will be coming to chat with us about not only the Human Baton, because he was just doing that with me um, a couple weeks ago in Texas, but he's also coming in to tell us about motivating kids and... (laughs) Kind of yep. long term process, kind yep. of a setup for that, um, you know, and his great work that he does with veterans and um, uh, uh, his projects and his sanctuary that he does for retreats for veterans and families and the equine therapy that he does and his training programs that he has um, online. And we're going to be posting up all that stuff online next week. But Calvin Evans, we will be talking to him next week. Excellent. So you guys have a great week, Lou. You have a fantastic week. I will. Enjoy it. I'm very malleable. I'll be able to do it. <laughs> Enjoy the snow coming again. <laughs> More? T- tomorrow. When? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, you guys. Have a great week, and go out there and delay that gratification and have a, have a nice one.